Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the FX Hour. I'm Blake Young here every Tuesday at 4.15 to discuss all things Forex and, of course, the global markets and everything else that seems to be going on or right or awry, depending on how you look at it. And we are here to discuss specifically Forex, but again, we will be starting out with this sell-off that happened in the market today. I want to remind you all that if you are interested in following us, you can follow all the shadow traders by going to My Trade. Go to My Trade, click on People, click on Technical Traders, and you'll see all of the shadow traders there. And you can follow each one of us. Each one of those will tell you, uh, give you instructions on how to follow us through Twitter, either with a Twitter handle or with a cell phone. You don't even have to have a Twitter account to do that. This is also recorded and will be posted to ShadowTrader.net. And under ShadowTrader.net, you can find that and a lot of other articles, news reports, etc., special publications. And you can subscribe to that ShadowTrader.net website. For those interested in my Twitter handle, SD underscore FX, and again, you can follow us through my trade. All right. My email is fxtrader at shadowtrader.net. If you have any questions, comments, or thoughts you think about during the week and you want me to try to include that in this weekly recording, you can certainly email me that or put it into the chat at any time while we're talking today. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to just the chart so that we can see a little bit better. And to do that, see if I can hit it the first time. And I did. Let me just restart the... There you go. You should be able to see just the chart. A little bit better image, full screen on the chart. And let's talk a little bit about this candle. So purely from a technical point, you'll notice where our circle is. Our circle, I tried to overlap it with that uh, bubble there. But my target for US equities last week or the week before, I can't remember, was this level at about 29.09. And when we were up here last week, might have seemed a little bit off. We were holding it support. And as you can see today, we did close down. If you look at our volume, I've got our volume built in a way, I'll stretch it out so you can see, that I have a 50, uh, an average, a 20 day average, and a 50% higher than normal average to show us whether we have high volume, low volume, et cetera. Well, today is a little bit higher than normal volume on a good sell-off, and I would argue this is a lower high. Now, it's still in the long-term consolidation, so I am still watching for it to come down and test and prove whether this is support or not. This is the shorter-term support consolidation, and this is the longer-term channel. And so I am looking for U.S. equities to drift lower, probably come down, not continue super fast, but probably have another down day, an up day, a down day, and reach down into this area by 10.7 to 10.9, so in those three days. Hello. So those are the targets that I'm looking for in the next week. Let's just call it the next week from today, okay? So again, I don't think it's going to be in one massive drop, but if we do, if we have one massive day bigger than today, where today was down, you know, one and a half percent ish at one point, if we have another one and a half percent day and drop below this, then I'm gonna treat this as resistance and a new lower high, and then we're looking at continuation back into this key area that we've talked about, I don't know how many times, and we can extend that over. Oops, maybe. Into this area, where it's our long-term reversal area. So there's a lot of supply in here, there's a lot of behavior that, that kicks in at this level between right around 2800. But I'm looking for that 2900 test, I expect another 38 point drop, Today was a drop of 40. So in essence, I'm expecting this drop again, but probably not in one day. Now, what could cause that? API in 10 minutes, thanks Iron. If you see the API numbers come out, certainly copy and paste those API numbers into the chat, that'd be great. But you know what could cause it? Absolutely nothing. So this is my view. We have a losing situation when it comes to the trade balance. I don't know if you saw the report when we were talking about the US was awarded an award in this trade battle between Airbus and, and Boeing. And so now we can apply a whole bunch of tariffs, I think in the tunes of billions, against Airbus. Well, it's going to take them at least into the first, maybe second quarter of 2020 to be able to apply the same tariffs back on the US. And so now we cre create a new, a new, what would you call it? Cross-border, 
trade battle. I don't know what to call it. But another country is now involved in this trade war, the tariff war, the fight in growth. Now, as we're watching the move today, ISM Manufacturing was also reported. And if we look at ISM Manufacturing, that came out at 6 a.m. I'm going to drop into the intraday. 8 a.m. my time. So right there, we have this, except I'm getting my times backwards. Yeah, eight, sorry, 8 a.m., 10 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. my time. ISM, Inter uh, Institute of Supply Management Manufacturing PMI. Now, manufacturing PMI came in at 47.8. This is the second month in a row that has crossed negative. And we looked at Chicago PMI, and I made a comment in yesterday's uh, commentary that Chicago's PMI was also negative, and it's been negative two out of the last four months. The other times that PMI, Purchasing Managers Index, has been below 50, I'm calling that negative, but below 50 in contraction, in a contraction instead of expansion state, if we look back historically, you'll see that that was in 2015-16, where we did have a market correction. We, a lot of people ignored it, but we did. The last time we had two months in a row before that, we have to go all the way back to guess when? 2008. And so the PMI numbers, the Purchasing Managers Index numbers, and again, we could go back even further, but the Purchasing Managers Index numbers are taking a really close look at what they are buying in preparation to fulfill on the demands of the public or commercial. It's simply the earliest view. So when we know that we look into manufacturing, we know that we look at factory orders, we look at all those things, but how do we know that factory orders are being prepared for? The orders get placed, but when the purchasing manager has to buy more raw goods, more inventory, more things to build and make and sell so they can sell their stuff, and that's gone below the 50, it's gone into contraction area every single time. This has been as good, if not better, indication of a massive correction, massive sell-off in at least the last 20 years. Because the only times, I mean, and I would encourage you to go look at this, the only times that we have had, here's this again, the announcement, below 50, that one hour, that really in that few minutes, that's where we had the bulk of today's drop. 28 out of 40 points, right there. Two thirds, three fourths, almost. So 75% of today's move happened on the PMI announcement. That PMI, earliest one of the earliest indications of an economic slowdown. And so again, this is the second month in a row for PMI. It's the second out of four months, two out of four months for Chicago PMI. And again, looking back historically, it happened in 2015-16. It happened in 2008, it happened in 2001, and it did happen in 2003. But other than that, there really isn't a time where it went below that 50 mark. And so causation, correlation, what does that mean? Looking back historically again, let's give ourselves a little bit more time. And I need to go into the right thing. I'm clicking on the wrong spot. Going back 20 years. Let's look at the monthly, since we are talking about monthly reports. Let's see. We went negative or we went into contraction instead of growth in September of 2000 and October of 2000. So here is September of 2000, October of 2000. Predictive any? Oh, well, that's kind of interesting. And we see the drop go from, again, this is, this is one of the earliest indicators in the economy. And that drop was followed by a 41% correction. Now in 2003 and 2004, we had a drop in October, sorry, 2002. In October, November of 2002, I had to look at my right ones. And you can see here, we went positive and then went right back to negative in October of 2002 and November 2002. Now that was just a tiny little drop right through here, but it still continued lower. It's kind of the end of that reversal. If we go forward and say, when did we first have two months in a row on ISM? We had it March of 2008 and April of 2008. So scrolling forward, March of 2008, April of 2008. Here is February, March, April. Now we did have one month that was small, small bullish. And by the way, that was March, April, May, June. All were negative. We crossed positive one month and then fell. 
So this one, if we look at this early on, from that point, we rallied a total of 3% before falling 53% from that point when the PMI numbers went into market contraction. Like I said, we did see the same thing in 2015. And the 2015 report, or the 2015 correction, right through here, not a huge correction as far as what it looks like, at least on this chart. But as we're looking at this, probably the better one to look at would be the Russell. Now, if I try to type in RTY, remember the RTY is a newer future. And so I can't get back that far. So forgive me to use the uh, just the IWM for just a second. And Nimble, I know what you're saying uh, as far as it makes sense in a normal market, but in the tweeter market, what does that mean? Because we know, and you know, again, this is not politics. It's simply that we know the market responds and reacts to tweets, news, changes, surprises, right? But this move through here, let's see, get my exact month here. Now I've got that song, Lonely Loser, stuck in my head. It's December, November, December, down it goes. And that right there, that's 16%. I would point out that the IWM had peaked and rolled over 27%. A lot of people didn't pay attention to that pullback in the end of 2015, 2016. So my point with this is not that I'm looking at any individual one type of thing to be a massive indicator that's going to be end all be all of uh, the next market cycle. What I'm looking at is factory orders, manufacturing, because we're still a manufacturing country. We just do a lot more software and electronics and uh, intellectual property. But when we see ISM, Chicago ISM, Philly Fed, uh, factory orders, uh, Institute of Supply Management, all of those are the earliest moves. And it's the market saying, okay, what demand do we have? What can we supply? What can we fulfill? And when they're buying more stuff, it means they've depleted their inventories or that they have, are using up their inventories at a rate that they can manage and they can, they're can they ready to start making more. When we see that that's going the opposite direction and has, if we look at ISM PMI, we have had um, since, let's see, okay, I'll tell you exactly since when, since August, sorry, September of last year, till today, or till this report, We've had 10 out of 12 months declining in the last two months negative. And I keep saying negative, but it's really sub 50, okay? So major down day, it's something we can't just ignore. So what would we expect to see? What would we expect to be able to adjust to? Let me see if I can throw. Let's see. Let me see if I can show you one of my favorite tools. And this will feed us back into the Euro US dollar and the dollar. And I need to see three months daily. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this chart. All it is is comparing the top sectors to each other. And I like to look at a three month time period. I think I have to switch charts I'm comparing and, and then we'll go to the oil prices. So when I say the US is a manufacturer trying to be a net importer, not going well. Um, one thing is still clear, we still are manufacturing. We just, we sell stuff to other people and then we eat some of our own and then we eat other people's manufacturing. It's just the way it is. So let's do this one. See if you can see this. All right. So this you should be able to see the you should be able to see the chart here. This right through here is just the last three months. Just the last three months. So, so trader trader asked the question: How did how did gold do in the in the past? ISM was that done. Uh, let's we'll go to that. How about let's do this oil, and then let's talk about gold. Because my whole point is again, is the market 
is reacting certainly to news, but when we see ISM, this is really telling us whether or not the there's demand, any demand. Now this is the sectors it last three months, so it's one quarter rolling. And what I'm looking at, if you look at this top one, that's utilities. Next one, real estate. Next one, consumer staples. Does anybody see a problem? And here's your here's your hot tip. <laughs> Where are the investors investing? Because as of today, technology is flat for the last quarter, 0.63% up. The S&P is officially negative and all the other sectors. The only three sectors that are positive are utilities, real estate, and consumer staples. These are defensive sectors. These are the number one, two, and three defensive sectors. Healthcare sometimes comes along in that mix too. But these are the three defensive sectors when people are looking for a return on investment. And they've made 8.59%. Utilities have made 8.59%. So yeah, Wolf says the wrong sector is leading, but what we're seeing is defensive sectors climbing and they're looking for, oh, puns, and they're looking for investments or sorry, in, uh, returns on investments, the investors are, buyers are. Utilities not only have gained 8.6% in a quarter, that puts you at 50% annualized, they also pay a dividend. They have to. Utilities all pay dividends. Same thing with XLRE, real estate. They're up 6.27%. They're averaging 25% annualized. And that 25% annualized, they're also paying a dividend. Now, this consumer staples, this is what oftentimes is called the uh, consumer staples or consumers non-discretionary or consumers non-cyclical. There's called lots of different things. But really what it is, it's the toilet paper index. We like to do these things. We like to live indoors. There's your real estate. We like to have utilities, water, power, et cetera, sewer. There's utilities. And we have the tendency to want to be able to still have our daily necessities met, which are your toilet paper, your toothpaste, etc. And so XLP, I always think of that XLP is in paper. And we can do the same thing with any index. If we wanted to actually put the indexes up here, I just like to watch the ones that are tradable. And so those are the only three that are done positive this last quarter. And so investors are looking for, where can I get a return? Because if they could look at getting a return, they might say, oh, I'll take 2% from the, from the uh, bonds. Well, I can get that same 2 to 3% and get market appreciation in these sectors. So to me, this is a, a warning sign. Now look at the very bottom one here. This is energy. And we'll go to oil next. Energy is down 9.3. It was down more. Here's where we had a little bombing. Then Saudis say we're going to be back online. And here we are down 9.3%. So the bombing, the attack was kind of a non-event. So let's go do this. Let me switch back to the other chart. And let's talk about oil. And then we'll come back to some of those others. Love it. Way to throw those in there. Uh, those are some of the stocks you'd find in the sector. I'll show you how else to do it here in just a second. But let's start with crude. And if we're doing crude, I'm going to drop this down. First off, point out, where are we at? We're really respecting the monkey bars this month. You can see it hit support, hit support, hit support, hit support. Now it did cross through, but it never really closed below this 120, which means it hasn't got bearish yet. New bearish. It's bearish since we exited above 20 post bombing this day from 917. Theoretically, should have been bearish. And now we're at the take profit area and created a spinning top or a doji, whatever. I'm not sure what I'd call this one. It could be a hammer with a very long handle. But at this point, I'm looking for confirmation either bullish bounce off of support or a bearish continuation. If we look at the API numbers, did someone give me API numbers? Yeah, when I switch when I switch charts, audio drops for just a second. Here's crude, fifteen minutes, five minutes. So our, our crude numbers must have uh, come in pretty a good drawdown, as I'm guessing, right? So what we saw in Baker Hughes this week is the U.S. dropped eight, Canada added eight, so it was a wash as far as week to week, and we're dealing with the same 
rough numbers as we did last week, where we're down from last year to this year, same time frame, we're down about 81 rigs. So not huge, but theoretically price should be higher. So let's see if we can find that API data. There we go. Thank you, Nimble, and any others that posted it. Negative 5.9 million barrels drawdown, expected a, a build of 1.6. Yeah, so there we go. Thanks, Nimble. So there you go. There's the demand. It went from 53.60 to 53.99, so up 40 cents in five minutes off of a much larger drawdown when it's expected to be a build. Okay. We'll come back to look at this one because I still looking at this as a new potential short, but it is at support. So a bullish candle that cl clears the upper shadow. It's just a candlestick pattern. Bullish pl play back up to 57.19 and bearish close. And certainly one that closes below 52.97 or 53, then I would say we are looking at bearish down to the next level. Now as copper is our inflation. Your comments about inflation will go from copper and then to gold. Copper, you can see, did a similar situation that we just saw in oil. Found support. This is a massive sledgehammer. See the huge handle? But it's still not a real candle to trade off of until we get the confirmation, which usually means just a trade above the high. And if you're going to trade above the high, generally I'll take the candle's range, in this case 62 cents, or 6.2 cents, excuse me. And I'll take 10% on top of that. So I'd take a 0 0.06 cent move above the high as an indication or confirmation that it's breaking out or just simply a bullish close. Let's do gold. And then let's look backwards on gold to look back at the ISM PMI numbers as well. It could be season blend changeovers. The short term supply numbers. I don't know though. Someone someone that might know. I don't know when that happened. I know it's soon. I know we we were freezing, literally freezing last night. All right. Quick analysis on this. Gold prices have rolled over. Gold prices have made lower highs and now lower lows as of yesterday. Today is a bounce back up, retest of a previous trend line or horizontal, excuse me, horizontal uh, support or resistance, and we stopped there. So this to me looks like a new downtrend, lower highs, lower lows. Historically, the question was, what did this look like in the past? I don't know if the, we can get our futures to go back that far, 20 years. Let's take a look, though. Sure enough, we can. So going back to 2000, when PMI, when PMI numbers <clears throat> went down, let's see what what I'd say that was. It was September of 2000. Oh, this is still weekly. Let's do monthly. Time frame: 20 years monthly. Okay. September of 2000, and then October of 2000, just to see, you know, still sliding. Lower, lower, a little bit lower. Um, I think it was September. I'm just double checking. Because I said what it was because I was looking at the chart, but now that I'm not looking at the chart, I've got to go back. And I keep saying negative, but I mean sub-50, contraction. So, yeah, September of 2000, October of 2000, and then the next time it was that we looked at was... First warning was um, January of 2008, but March of 2008 is when we went to twice negative. So this one did drop, and we dropped, get my trend line, we dropped down about 4.5%, 4.8% in four months. Looking forward to 2008, now what exactly was the month? That it was our, we did cross negative January 2008, but the we had the next negative was March, and then April was the second month. So April of 2008, March of 2008, there's March, April. And then from there, we pushed higher. So gold was a hedge on that one. 
So I'm not seeing the same correlation, right? So there's March, April. We did drop to, I mean, we did drop 21.8% in seven months. And then it turned the corner. So maybe there is still pretty positive correlation. 21% drops pretty good. And then we talked about that time frame in 2015 that we no one pays attention to as a market correction. But that was November, Dece sorry, December, January of 2015 and 16. Let's do that one really quick. And then we'll do the Euro US dollar. 2015, 2016. So there's negative, negative. Not any correlation here. You see that was actually the bottom of the of gold prices. So non-correlation on that one. And then not a lot of correlation right now either. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd really look at the same correlation on gold. It doesn't look like it's about 50-50, right? 50-50 the time it would go up, go down. It doesn't really matter. And remember, gold is not an indication of growth. Gold primarily is an inflation hedge. That's what it's treated like. And so when I'm looking at these things, gold, you, you understand that there's a cost of carry with gold. It actually costs you money to buy and hold gold. It costs you the interest rate. It's really what it is, the going interest rate. So gold costs you about 2% a year right now to hold it. And then it has to go higher to offset that gain. And as I look at this, this to me is a break of trend, lower highs, lower lows. This could be a great Fibonacci reversal target. We take this lower high like so. Ah, let me cl close, closed through it. So I'm going to duplicate that. And then I'm going to take this retracement line. And remember, we're just looking at kind of the targets. And to do that, I've got to switch it back to Fibonacci values instead of my monkey bar values, 0 0.382, 0 0.618. There we go. So if gold stays below this lower high, then 1.1458 a little bit later on, if all these countries start, um, if all these countries start to do easing, including the U.S., Europe, etc., then gold's probably going to find a foothold. And then if it breaks through this trend line, we're back into bullish territory. But as it sits here, I'd be looking for I would probably say a test of fourteen twenty four by next Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, Wednesday, fourteen twenty five by next Wednesday. Now, again, this is the inflation hedge. If all things are the same, then you're correct in saying no growth means no inflation and gold falls. But if we see no growth and we see central banks messing things around, then gold can go up even though we don't have growth. Today was a big volume day on copper, but it did recover. So again, tomorrow would be the day that gives us the clue. Let's go look at the Euro US dollar. Now the Euro US dollar, you can see right through here, we had our monkey bar levels, we broke through support, retested it, broke even lower across the 120, retested it. Overall, there's still some weight to the downside. We've already talked about the uh, exposure that the, the Eurozone has, and that it's talking quantitative easing with their, their bond purchase program. So this does have the, the markings to continue to go lower. Now, we did not hit this target. I left that blue circle there. This one's, we never broke through resistance, so it doesn't matter. So we can get rid of this. And we'd put it somewhere in this area. If it does break this trend line, then we'd look for a recovery up to 111 by the end of October. So we could throw that on. And that, of course, re that requires a break of re this resistance trend line. Now, if it stays below this level, then we're just going to move this one out. Activate drawing, oval. I try not to move these except in this group. And so I'm going to put it where this intersection is at 180, at 108.09. We got really close to our target this morning. 
And so if we trade above uh, yesterday's high, we'll probably just exit our positions with gain. But if we roll over, especially as we, we see the, the uh, uh, come on, what's tomorrow? Non-farm payroll, the ADP non-farm payroll. Jobs data is this week because it is now the beginning of October. So jobs data comes out tomorrow with ADP giving us the first glimpse. ADP is expected to show a job slowdown. So one more thing, right? So yeah, I'll, I'll do the Hong Kong dollar, sure. Um, but one more thing that seems to be showing that things are slowing down. Crude inventories, we already saw API today. Crude inventories, EIA comes out tomorrow and it's expected to slow. But remember, we expected to see some build today, but we didn't see a build, we saw a drawdown. And so we'll probably see a drawdown in the EIA tomorrow. That should mean that crude goes up a little bit more. ADP, ADP showing a slowdown in jobs could mean that we see further slowdown, market drops even further tomorrow, and then Friday we'll get a bigger reaction to non-farm payroll, historically speaking. All right, let's take a look at... Just reading really quickly the chat. All right. So even even through here, just a really quick note. This is lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low, low. So even though there's been back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, the pressure is still on to the downside. But there is a little bit of widening that's gone over the last two days. If I drop this down into the intraday, you'll see what I'm talking about, that we've been making these lower highs and lower lows. Even though it's kind of been choppy, it's still making lower highs and lower lows. And as we're watching this, you'll see that what I just was talking about, that expansion, that widening volatility, because we were dropping at this pace, and then we broke that trend. We're dropping at this pace on the downside. And so this could be a new widening pattern. So see how it's widening out? Widening pattern is usually an indication of trend change or trend reversal. I wouldn't put it like that, but I would, I'd say we definitely broke through that. And so this is trying to decide whether it wants to change. But this is a strong resistance area. We'll see if it holds at 109.50. If it does, then we stay short. We'll look for our target to be reached, possibly even add to it on the rollover below 109.07. But this widening pattern is a warning. So we want to step away from that when that is done with its very steep downtrend. But the news still seems to be supporting the US dollar and less the euro. Um, let me do the pound because the pound, as you can see, sold off, tried to break through, and then bounced, creating another bullish candle or another reversal candle like yesterday at a key level of support, which is our horizontal monkey bar level. And now if we get a bullish close, I would expect the pound to come up to this level. Now we've hit our targets here and here and here. So let's go ahead and put another short-term target. If we get above today's high, then I would be looking for this level. I would love to see that level tested. It's the same level we tested back here on the 17th. I'd love to see it tested again next Wednesday or Thursday. And then after it tests that level, roll over, give us a lower high, break this support level quickly, because then we'll have lower highs, lower lows, and I would be looking for the next move to break through these lower shadows and drop back down probably back down to 120.78, somewhere out here. Now that's all conditional upon a bullish close tomorrow and failure at 124.14. But that does set us up for some pretty solid reversal and new bearish trend in the favor of the US dollar versus the pound. Now the pound New Zealand, we missed our short trade by a couple of pips, but we're seeing that bounce. I'm looking for this to get back up anywhere below this previous resistance. This is the channel width. And so I marked this up. I was looking at this earlier today. It's obviously not happening today. So as I'm looking at this, we'll see if it happens tomorrow. And I'm just marking up that high close. Right, close enough. So any rollover through here would be a lower high. We've got a short order in this area, about 198. I think we did 198.50, 198.80, somewhere there. I'll have to double check the position. But we're going to look to sell it on a lower high then break through support, and then when it breaks through support, we're looking for a drop down to 192.41. Right now, the pound's gaining on the New Zealand, but that was just a recovery on the US dollar. So the New Zealand dollar still is weakening, as you can see right through here. New record lows on the New Zealand US dollar. 
All right. Hong Kong dollar. The question was, what's happened to the Hong Kong dollar? With the protests, with China, the the super anniversary of communism, communism rule, communist rule, excuse me. Initially, we broke down to the downside. That's Hong Kong dollar strength, US dollar weakness. We reversed back up and we've just given back whatever gains they had during that one week. And here we are back at the same level. Now, part of the reason why this isn't doing much is because this entire range, it, the Hong Kong dollar is pegged to the US dollar and the yuan. And so it, it really matches the Chinese economy, but it also is has a s subtle peg to the US dollar. So we normally don't see massive long-term trends until we see major economic changes. But then you see even on these massive sell-offs, it reversed right back up in a matter of a few months. And we've been in this range for a long, long time. You look back historically, it likes being up in this area between nine or 785 and 783 or 784 and 785. It breaks down, but comes back, breaks down, comes back, breaks down, comes back. So if you can participate in the breakdown and the reversal, there could be some real opportunities in there. And again, this is kind of like the VIX. I like it from a horizontal support and resistance, not as much of the trends. Trends are a little bit harder to trade because they reverse quick. But the horizontal support bounces and breaks, pretty good. All right. So what's what's the magical number for crude? Oh, you want to see Amazon. So let's talk about Amazon when it comes down to consumer purchases. Is this a weekly head and shoulders? Uh, are you spelling weekly with an A? That's a joke. Maybe not a funny one. Um, let's clear off all our drawings. Well, we can leave them on. No, let's clear them off. I don't need these drawings. They're old. I would show you, um, well, it likes this slope, this angle, but we can redraw this. So I'm going to remove all drawings, clear drawing set. Yes. All right. So from a weekly view, it's, it's a tough one to call as a head and shoulders because this doesn't look like this. This, you know, this is such a large high. This is such a large high. I'd call this, boy, I don't know what I'd call it. I'd probably call it a slanted double top. I mean, it's at an angle, but I'd almost look at it something more like this and try to capture those resistance lines. Maybe even something like this. So it's almost like it's trading as a channel. And now that it's broken through the support, I guess it's semantics, right? I don't. If you want to call it head and shoulders, great. Call it head and shoulders. It's the same target. It's this channel height, which is 300 points. And if you did it as a head and shoulders off of here down to here, if this is your neckline, right where this support is, what are we at? 272, 275. So I'm I'm within 25 points of either the 300 or 275. And either instance, whether I call it the head and shoulders or, or call it a channel, I'd still be watching for it to drop down somewhere between 300 from the breakout here or 275 from the breakout there and puts us down to 1500 to 1460. So there's a potential in there one way or the other. Whoops, sorry. One way or the other, there's a good potential in there. Now that ties us back one more time to what I've said before. What should you watch? Well, if manufacturers aren't buying stuff, that would that says they're not preparing to sell stuff. And if they're not preparing to sell stuff, it's because other people aren't buying stuff from them, whether wholesalers or retail. And so in the end, what we're looking at is we're looking at whether consumer finance and credit card transactions. Remember that Visa, one of their largest things, in fact, let's go quickly to the Analyze tab on the fundamentals of Visa. And if you're to look at Visa's fundamentals, what percentage of their income, transactions fees now is 34.6%.
International fees are 27%. So transaction fees are a third of their $652 million of net cash or their transactions. Sorry, not the net cash um, of their total revenues. So a third of its transaction fees. So they're doing a lot of point of sell. But the same thing would hold true, right? Whether we're talking about that they have a lot of people carrying balances or people are spending money, whether, one way or the other, if they're spending money on the card or spending money using a Visa debit card, Visa still gets paid at point of sell. So as you look at right through here, and hey, by the way, anyone have have uh, Kroger's, Teeter Harris, Smith's, Fred Myers, any of those near you? Are the, is it nationwide that the battle between Kroger Company and Visa? Does anybody know? I know it's in multiple states where they no longer accept Visa. No longer accept Visa credit cards because of fight over transaction costs. Anyway, MasterCard's down here. It looks very much like Visa. All right, so, so it sounds like it's across the country. So those are all Kroger's, Fred Myers, Harris Teeter, Smith. They're all the uh, Kroger family. Uh, American Express is down even more. It looks like it's trying to break through. In fact, today is the lowest close. Yep. Today is the lowest close for American Express since June. This is lower highs, lower lows. We're breaking out and now showing even more weakness there. So as we're looking at all that, that seems to be certainly weighing down what we'd expect from consumers. As we look at some of the other indexes, let's go. We already did the S&P. There's S&P futures. We already talked about the target of 2900. If it breaks 2900, we'll look for 2800. As we look at Ru the the Russell, Russell's selling off a little bit more quickly. We don't even have a support level really to play off of that much, but it's still the same 20% barrier on our monkey bars. So watch for a move below today's low. And if we do, I would expect we should hit 1459 and realistically 1425 by the end of the month. The uh, NASDAQ. Oh, you want natural gas. I thought you were looking at the other indexes. NASDAQ is not selling off as much. Tech is at break even, if you recall, is at 0.6% for the last quarter. So it's not as weak as some of the other sectors. You were looking at natural gas, though, not at oil. Or not at, uh, I thought you were typing NQ because I glanced at it too fast. So natural gas continuing to slide back down lower. Um, I would just watch production numbers. This is a great one to watch on, on the rig count. More rigs that are open. The more production for natural gas, the more production for natural gas. Remember, it's harder to transport, even compressed. So when the U.S. is manufacturing more oil, I would expect natural gas to fall further. Now, we had a cold snap here that's coming your way, all you East Coasters. So when I say a cold snap, we're about 15 degrees colder than normal for this time of year. Not enough for me to fire up the heater because I've got to get it all vacuumed out but like I said we were free literally freezing this morning at the first day of October all right so there's natural gas it's at a support level if it can clear today's low I'd say 208 is the next level 208 210 all right we've already covered copper we've covered gold we've covered we didn't cover silver Here's silver doing something similar. We broke through support. Notice the lower highs, lower lows, broke through the trend line. This is a really steep one for our Fibonacci reverse anchor technique. And we'll lead from here into uh, the peso. Because they used to be highly, highly correlated. And if you don't mind, we will draw a monkey bar. And put our target down to 1523 if we stay below 1730. That's a major sell-off. There it is. All right, let's go through a few others quickly. We didn't talk about pound US dollars to the Aussie US dollar. Well, that's what I'm saying, Karen, watch out. We're, we're sending that cold to you. You're going to get a polar vortex again and instead of a in January or whatever. We'll send it to you in October. 
So it goes from the west to the east. All right, what do we have? Big sell-off, bounce, rollover resistance, breakthrough support. This is a solid breakthrough support. And recall that Aussie lost ground because they lowered rates. It was expected that they were going to lower rates. They did lower rates. And it started really last night, overnight, tried to move higher, closed down, and that trend is likely to continue. You know, one of the ones I was going to do, oh, I should have, lit, Lydia, sorry. I, normally, it's the, I was completely spacing that it's October 1st. Normally, we should be redrawing all of our monkey bars. But I forgot. Sorry. All right, let me go through the currencies really quickly. It'll give us about 15 minutes so we can go through the, how about we go through the major indexes and the euro and whatever we can get through there, there really quickly. So we already talked about the Aussie dollar selling off. That trend is likely to continue. I actually had all prepared um, to go through some of the historic interest rates and when they're raising them and when they're falling, what it did to the currencies. But we can save that for another day because it is more of a historic explanation. We already showed the New Zealand dollar. New Zealand dollar is attached to the Australian dollar at the hip. And so if the Australian dollar gets hurt, the New Zealand dollar falls as well and drops down a little bit further. We've already talked about that it's not following dairy. Dairy is done great, and it's just not tracking it at all. U.S. dollar, Canadian dollar. U.S. dollar gained initially, but the Canadian dollar pulled it back right to the same support level. And that's when we need to redraw those monkey bars. U.S. dollar, Swiss. U.S. dollar Swiss and U.S. dollar Swiss rejected resistance, tested one. Oh, I missed it. Remember that parody that we kept watching? Tested one again. This monkey bar was awesome, and we just held so well. So we can redraw this one as well. But you can see that attempt crossed the one, fell back down, closed lower, and now we'd be looking for it to drift down to 98.16. US dollar Japanese yen is set up for lower highs, but not lower lows until we break through the lows. It's played this over and over again. You'll notice, I mean, I don't even really have to draw the lines. You can see roughly where they're at. I mean, this is where that upper resistance area is. This is a lower high attempt failure, self confirming reversal or engulfing candle, massive engulfing candle. This is a lower high. In fact, I'd look at that and say, I would favor yen positions. I mean, that's that simple. Favor yen positions, not necessarily sell the US dollar, but favor yen positions on many many different charts. Taking us to the Aussie yen, which we're still in this short, and we close down at this level. So at this point, we're going to ratchet our stop down right above the highs, and we're still watching for it to drop down to the 71.30 area. All right, let's do some monkey bars really fast in the last 10 minutes that we have, unless you have other things you wanted to cover. I'm going to start with the S&P and with the S&P, we're going to take this, we're change it over to the monkey bars. We have this August. We now are going to define September projecting into October. To do that, we're going to take the low to the high. Low is 2892.50. Close enough. Like I said, I'm going to do it a little quick here. 3025.75. We're bullish as far as the chart goes. It's a P pattern. Definite bullish skew. But where did we finish the month? Let's take a look. Here's our 200% target. Oops. And there we go. So we broke down, tested the 120, but didn't break through the 120. So anything below this line is starting to get bearish. If we close below the 120, then we'd be bearish on the S&P, theoretically, all the way back to 2865 to get into that lower reversal zone, but watch for a bounce at 2900, which is projected fair price. Exactly the price we talked about, right? No different. I said 2900, and then if it broke there, I had to look for 2800. So as we look at this a little closer, or 2850, this trend line, we said 2800 down in this area. But right now, Look at that, where they all intersect. That's a definite confluence of information right there. So we take a look at the Euro US dollar. Euro US dollar, we switch over to the monkey bars here. Low is 108.84. High is 111.09.
bullish skew, but obviously we closed below that, so we're going to project everything to the downside. So the euro US dollar now has a what was the projected bullish skew is confirmed bearish, reversed out of it, just like a channel breaking its support. Bullish channels are bullish until they break support, then there's a bearish trade signal. It's kind of the same thing we're doing with these. So where did we finish? We finished yesterday, not only in the lower channel, but below the 150. We'd stay bearish on this from anything below 109.95. We'd stay bearish. And now that downside target is maybe 108.34. But look for bounces below 108.66. Because we uh, because we're at low amounts of time left, let me know if there's specific charts you want to hit because we won't be able to get through all of them. Pound US dollar. I already marked all these up as far as our targets. I'm gonna leave that uh, fan on there. Monkey bars. Low, 1.1958. High, 1.2338. Nope, just kidding. 125.81. 125.81. There we go. Bullish skew. Probably had to do gold before we finished today, too. There we go. So now our support level, the bottom of our channel is right here at 122.73. It's held, it's held, it's held, and this is where we're really starting the month with this as a barrier. So at this point, if you want the extra confirmation, there's certainly sell opportunities at fair price of near 125, but a break below 122.70 would be taking us to the bearish channel, and a close below 122 would look have me looking for 120.45, previous support, and even down to 119. Let's do gold. Now this we did as a reversal. Um, let's do our monkey bars. I'm just have to help me remember that this was from a lower highs, lower lows. Fourteen seventy fifty. Oh, come on. High is one fifteen sixty six twenty. Trying to get it on the close enough. I'm off two times here on this. Okay, bearish skew. Bring it down to the 200. There we go. So taking a look at gold prices, we're below this area, which means we stay bearish from 1518 down to 1466 and look for a bounce. If it breaks through 1446 and definitely if it clears 1432, then we'd still be more bearish down to 1410, if not down to 1388. This is our Fibonacci fan and Fibonacci retracements target. But overall, we're bearish below 1518 on the monkey bars. Let's redraw the OS again, since we have a position on. We probably ought to re reevaluate this one. Did I already do this one? I didn't do this one, did I? I nope, I didn't. OK. Not a huge range. Aussie dollar traded, or Aussie yen traded pretty flat until today. 7108. 7448. 
is our anchor point, slightly bullish skew. Up to the 7486-ish, right there. All right. So there's the breakthrough 120. This is our target on the channel, but we'd definitely still be bearish down to the 7108 area to 7066. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see it fall back and then do this kind of thing. Test support, come back on, and then test support again by the end of October. Gold, head and shoulders, 1415 target. And again, this is where I'd say, I don't know if I'd call it head and shoulders. Oh no, th this one's a little better. Uh, Amazon wasn't quite the head and shoulders I'd call it. This one, when they're sloping down like this, if you go here for the neckline, well, that was horizontal. It never really established the neckline. So if then you slope it downward, then it's not, this is sloping down and the shoulders are sloping up. Do you see that? So it's a little bit harder to read as a head and shoulders. Not that anything is really ever perfectly textbook. I'd say it's a bearish wedge that broke out to the downside and then retraced. Um, a little bit harder to read. At least the way I'd see it. Apple's Reddit is a resistance. Um, we've done this a few times. Let's... I mean, the long term we have way down here. I don't. I'm just going to get rid of it for now. This is a shooting star candlestick. Needs confirmation, but a bearish candle tomorrow would be confirmation. And we're saying resistance is there, and we're looking for a, a drop. That drop, at least right now, would say 218. And I know this is Apple, so some will instantly disregard everything I'm saying because they believe that Apple can do no wrong. But we'll go from 204.22. It's at resistance. It's created a shooting star, but shooting stars are not self-confirming. 226.42, 226.42, 226.42. Is it really on 226.42? Right there, close enough. Let's find a new action point on this one. Oops. All right, just for you, because I like you, you're a lovely person. There you go. So long term, we had these long term support and resistance off of monkey bars back in June, it looks like, and that's still holding as resistance. Our immediate September time frame, we're at the 50%. It's fair price projected for October. If it trades higher, I would look for shorts between 230 and 234, but. Realistically, I wouldn't get too bearish until it closed below 211. If it closed below 211, then I'd look for 200. So I don't know if I'd get that as bearish on it. Could. I mean, 211 is is a solid drop, but 200 is 10%. So. But right now it's right now it's still bullish, still in the upper channel at fair price and a non-confirmed bearish candle. So until it does something more than that, I wouldn't worry too much about it. All right, let's do, we did, uh, see, we did pound. On this one, like I said, we already told you that we're looking for a short up in this area. I didn't do the monkey bars on this one. Let's go to do the monkey bars really quickly. This is a dual auction or double auction, double distribution, whatever you want to call that one. And we're going to go from the low from 189.92 I've heard him referred to as both there, 189.92. Up to a high of 199.99. Good enough. So we could try to draw 
two distributions and figure out where we're going to be. Um, this pair really likes to move when it does move, so I would just take into consideration that this distribution was there. It's not perfectly distributed either side. It's pretty evenly distributed on this downside. This pair loves to move when it moves. And there we go. So our monkey bars here tell us that we're in the, in the oversold area in the upper channel. But if it drops back below the zero, and certainly if it drops below the 20%, the 192.88, then we'd expect it to drop down to 189.70, and even down to 186.51, and you say, wow, you're saying a 1,000 pip drop? That's what it did in August, 1,000 pip climb. Another almost 1,000 pips in September. So a 1,000 pip drop is not outside of the outlandish to assume that that could happen. All right. Yeah, long time, long way to confirm the pattern. So when you're saying the, the could it get that ugly? A lot of things have to happen between then and then. Fall the time of apple, right? Apples fall off the tree. Okay, well we are over time. So we did cover all of our major currency pairs. We covered gold. We covered copper, silver. We covered it. Um, few of your favorite stocks. We talked about indexes, or sectors, excuse me, sectors, in fact, that were all defensive sectors, at least the sectors that pay dividends. And uh, so that's a little bit of warning. We talked about ISM, Chicago PMI, factory orders, all going into market contraction, and we're seeing that consumer finance and purchases are slowing down as well. And that's a little bit of concern, especially as we go into the fall and start watching for retail sales to pick up. So we'll continue to watch this. We'll, we'll finish out the other monkey bars that we didn't get to today next time. Otherwise, have a great week, everybody. Have a successful trading week. We'll look forward to talking to you next week, same time, same place. Don't forget, you can follow all the Shadow Traders by going to shadowtrader.net. This is recorded. will be posted to YouTube, and I'll send you a tweet if you're following my Twitter account so that you know that it's available to you. And other than that, everybody have a great week, and again, sweet dreams.